Good morning. Trying to get my music going here. Here we go. Let's praise to God together this morning. It's a new day. your ride. ride. Oh, well, come give me a kiss. Before I start, my little squishy. <laughs> give me a hug. Mwah, I love you. I love you too. Have a great day. How's everybody today? I hope well. We had a lovely evening last night. My husband received the St. Tammany Parish President's Award for Performing Artist of the Year. So proud of him. He's the real musician. Really. Like he reads theory for fun <laughs> and he's pra- played for all kinds of famous people, put orchestras together for people, Tony Bennett, Lady Gaga, Rod Stewart, Ray Charles a bunch of times, Johnny Mathis. Anyway, he's had quite a, quite a career for 50 something years. 
And um, he's a little bit older than I am. Same birthday, way different date. And um, anyway, so I'm just so proud of Mal. He is just such a sweetheart and he's so humble. Won't toot his own horn, so to speak. So I'm doing it for him. I was telling somebody last night that um, I put a, a resume together with him because he had never even put together a list of all the people he played for. I'm like, honey, this is really impressive. And so I was typing it out and I'm like, Rex Harrison, Shirley MacLaine, Yul Brenner, Rod Stewart, Kitty Cleveland. I told him he had to keep it in. <laughs> it was funny. Okay. So we're back with Time for God. It's Friday. You know, today is a really great day to fast. So you ask the Lord what that might look like for you. But to make our bodies a living sacrifice, as we let our bodies know our souls are in charge... I got myself a new Fitbit yesterday, so I'm trying to get my 10,000 steps in a day and keeping track of my water. I try to drink two of these a day, but also today just um, one meal. And just to start so that one Lent, and, you know, Advent is a little mini Lent and we're getting ready to start Advent. So, um, does Advent start Sunday? Bye, honey, because the Feast of Christ of King is Sunday. Does that start Advent? I should know this. I always feel like sun Advent, I mean, uh, Christ the King is the last Sunday, but it's not. It's it's It varies, and so it's this Sunday is Feast of Christ the King. So does that start Advent? Y'all tell me. I know you know more than I do. Okay. Um. So Advent is a little mini Lent is what I'm saying, and... As we're making more time for God, um, fasting is a great way for us to uh, give a little turbo boost to our prayers. And I did start a Facebook page called Taking Care of the Temple. If you want to join us, um, I haven't been super active on it the last couple of weeks, but there's some great <clears throat> articles there that I've linked to on fasting, how to fast, different ways that we can fast, and little things hopefully to encourage and inspire you as the Holy Spirit is leading you. There are no rules on that. You know, it's as God is leading you. Okay. So, and let me just also add a little caveat. If you have struggled with eating disorders, especially anorexia, fasting, not a good idea. Unless it's just like abstaining from certain things like sugar, alcohol, whatever. But um, we don't want to like send somebody, trigger someone and send them into a relapse. Okay. All right. Back to Time for God with Father Jacques Philippe. Yeah, this Sunday is Christ the King. Advent starts November 29th. Okay, thank you so much, friends. Um, so we are on page 87, part five, some methods of mental prayer. Story time with Aunt Kitty. Number one, preliminary ideas. Next, in light of what has been said so far, a few thoughts on the main methods of mental prayer. Quite often, none is required. But it's sometimes helpful to be able to fall back on one or another of the methods to be covered here. First, how do you choose one way of praying over another? We are absolutely free in this manner. You hear me? You know, everybody, some people just want, tell me the rules. You're free. You're a child of God. You're free. And each should choose the method that suits him or her best. In which, in which, he feels at ease and can grow in love for God. What feels most comfortable for you? Like for me personally, it's not litanies. They just don't do it for me. I check out. Um, but contemplation, adoration, yes, that really works for me. Lexio Divina, digesting the scriptures. So whichever method we use, there will be time, I'm sorry, uh, whatever method we employ, we must take pains to remain in the spiritual climate or attitude described above, what makes us feel at ease and grow in love for God. The Holy Spirit will guide us and do the rest. We also need to, you know the word, persevere. Whichever method we use, there will be times of dryness. Expect it. You're not doing it wrong. Okay, there will be dryness. And we must avoid the temptation to abandon a way of praying after just a few days because we're not getting the expected results. Yet at the same time, we need to be free and detached. 
Up to now, perhaps, we've prayed in a way we found good and fruitful. But if the Spirit prompts us to leave it because it's time for something else, we should not cling to what we've grown accustomed to. Finally, several different methods can be combined so that, for example, part of our mental prayer is spent on meditation and part dedicated to the Jesus prayer, just repeating the name of Jesus over and over. But beware of the danger of flitting from one thing to another. Hmm, he knows me. Butterfly brain, flit about, don't do that. It is not a good idea to switch to a different way of praying every few minutes. Mental prayer should have a certain stillness, a stability, enabling it to be a real exchange of love at a deep level. The movements of love are slow and peaceful. They are stable attitudes because they involve the whole of our being in receiving God and giving ourselves. Slow, peaceful, still allows a real exchange of love at a deep level. Now, I've mentioned this before, but when sometimes because we live in such a busy world, we've been consuming media, our brains are on overstimulation. It can take some time to like calm down our minds, calm down our bodies. And so when I find myself really distracted by things that I need to do or that my brain is telling me I need to do, I just keep a pad of paper, not my iPhone, because then I get distracted by all the text messages or that text messages I've received. I keep a pad of paper and I just jot it down so that I can let it go. Little jot down, let it go, return to Jesus. Sometimes it happens 10, 12 times. In 20 minutes. Okay. Number two, meditation. <clears throat> As we saw earlier, meditation has been the basis of, of almost all the methods of mental prayer proposed in the West since at least the 16th century. This fact should be borne in mind when reading classical authors like St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross. Otherwise, there's a risk of misunderstanding certain of their teachings, which assume that the person has started along the path of mental prayer through the practice of meditation and which may not be applicable without modification to someone who's entered on the way of mental prayer by another route, as often happens today. That was a little footnote. But it goes even further back than that. Being rooted in the constant custom of the church and in the Jewish tradition that preceded it, of a spiritual interiorized reading of scripture that leads to prayer, monastic Lectio Divina, the reading of scripture or spiritual books, is one of the most characteristic examples. Meditation starts with a period of preparation, which may be shorter or longer, and may or may not have a definite structure by which one places oneself in God's presence, invokes the Holy Spirit, etc. The meditation itself consists of reading a scripture text or a passage from a spiritual writer slowly, then making some considerations about it, trying to understand what God wants to tell us through this text and how to apply it to our lives. Again, Tim Gray, praying scripture for a train change. Great little primer on that. These considerations should enlighten our minds and nourish our love so that we can express the feelings to which they give rise and make resolutions as a result. Thus, the purpose of this reading is not to increase intellectual knowledge, but love for God. It should not be rushed, but should be done slowly, dwelling on each point, ruminating on it as long as is possible, as as on it as long as it provides nourishment for the soul and turning it into prayer, conversation with God, acts of thanksgiving or adoration. Having, as it were, wrung all the benefit possible from one point, we should go on to the next point or the next passage of the text. Often it's advisable to end with a prayer summing up all we have meditated, thanking our Lord for it, and asking him for the grace to put it into practice. So it should change us. It should change the way we're living our lives. What change, what resolution is the Lord asking me to make? Many books give methods and themes for this kind of meditation. 
As an example, see the beautiful letter from Father Lieberman to his nephew found in Appendix 1, or the advice given by St. Francis de Sales in his Introduction to the Devout Life. The advantage of meditation resides in its accessibility as a method of starting mental prayer. It's not very difficult to put into practice and avoids the risk of spiritual laziness by involving activity, our thought processes, and our will. However, it also has certain dangers. Sip of coffee before we go into dangers. It may become more of a mental exercise than a movement of the heart. And we may end up paying more attention to the considerations we make about God than to God himself. The pleasure we take in our own cleverness may cause us to become subtly attached to it as a form of intellectual activity. So I know some people do Lexio Divina where they're like, okay, step one, read this passage, do, 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 check. Step two, do, 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 check. That can become more about us. It's a guide. But the whole point of it is to take us into contemplation and to a change. So we need the silence. We need some stillness. Then, too, meditation, generally speaking, becomes, sooner or later, quite simply impossible. The mind can no longer meditate, read things, and make considerations, etc., in the way just described. But this is normally a good sign. What? Yes. Um, St. John, this is in a footnote, St. John of the Cross lays down some ways to determine whether incapacity to meditate is really a sign that God wishes to lead a person into deeper contemplative prayer or a period. The dryness could obviously be caused by other things, either lukewarmness, which involves losing a taste for the things of God, or psychological causes, a sort of mental exhaustion that blocks interest in anything whatsoever, like a depression. If it proceeds from God, this inability to meditate will be accompanied by two things. First, a definite inclination toward silence and solitude, the desire to remain quietly in God's presence. And second, the absence of any desire to apply one's imagination to anything but God. Okay. Such dryness often means that God wants to lead the soul into a way of mental prayer that is more stark, but deeper and more passive. As has been explained, this is an indispensable step. By the way, I don't know that I've ever gotten here, just in case you're wondering. Meditation unites us to God by concepts, images, and sense impressions. But God is beyond all that. And at a certain point, we must leave it all behind in order to find God in himself by traveling a way that is poorer, the way of the nothing, says St. John of the Cross, but brings our essential selves closer to his essence. St. John of the Cross's basic lesson is not so much about how to meditate well, but how to leave meditation behind when the time comes without getting upset, welcoming the inability to meditate as a gain instead of a loss. You know, as I think about this, I think that this is where I would often give up on prayer when it was no longer had consolations, when I couldn't pray and I would be with the Lord in adoration and it was just nada. Nada, nada, nada. That's where I really needed to press in, and instead I checked out. Okay, I hear you. To sum up, meditation is good insofar as it frees us from attachment to the world, to sin, and to lukewarmness, and brings us closer to God. But we need to know how to leave it aside when the time comes. And obviously, it's up to God's wisdom and not us to decide when that is. Note, too, that even if we no longer practice meditation as our habitual form of mental prayer, it can sometimes be good to go back to it. Reading and considerations and a more active search for God can be useful in keeping us from falling into a sort of spiritual laziness or slackness in mental prayer, as can happen. 
Finally, even if meditation is not or is no longer the basis of one's mental prayer, Lexio Divina should have a place in everyone's spiritual life. So that's an important point. If you don't know how to do it, get the book. Look, uh, time, my, my brain. Tim Gray's Praying Scripture for a Change. It is essential to read scripture or spiritual books frequently to nourish the mind and heart on the things of God while being ready to interrupt the reading from time to time so as to pray about points that strike us. Is meditation really a suitable form of mental prayer for people today? There's no reason why it shouldn't be, provided we can avoid the pitfalls just mentioned and can draw benefit from it. At the same time, it's undoubtedly true that present-day mindsets and forms of spiritual experience cause many people to feel ill at ease with meditation and more at home with a less systematic but simpler and more immediate sort of mental prayer. So point number three, the Jesus prayer. The Jesus prayer or prayer of the heart is the royal way to the life of prayer in the Eastern Christian tradition and especially in Russia. It has become fairly widespread in the West in recent years, and it's good that it's that it has, because it can lead many souls to inner prayer. You know, I actually did this last night. This isn't something that I usually do, just repeating the name of Jesus over and over. But I made the mistake of reading and watching some videos about the election last night. Lost my peace. Surprise, surprise. Why would I do that right before bed, too? I just get all these text messages. Yelp. Oh, texting. It's me, the end of me. And I, you know, I just needed to stop the notifications. But anyway, I lost my peace. I was trying to go to bed and I was feeling anxious. And so I just started praying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Bringing myself into his presence. And then I fell asleep like a peaceful little baby. The Jesus prayer consists of the repetition of a short formula, such as, Lord Jesus, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. The formula must contain the name of Jesus, the human name of the word. This way of praying is linked to a very beautiful spirituality of the name rooted in the Bible. It is a very ancient tradition because the name of Jesus contains his presence. It's not just a name. It can To say his name is to have the presence of Jesus with you. Among many others, St. Macarius of Egypt, who lived in the 4th century, witnesses to it. The most ordinary things were for him signs that led him to raise his eyes to the supernatural. Thus he reminded St. Pemmon of a habit of Eastern women. When I was a child, I used to see them chewing betel nuts to sweeten their saliva and remove any bad odor from their mouths. That is what the name of our Lord Jesus Christ should be for us. If we chew this blessed name by pronouncing it constantly, it brings all sweetness to our souls and reveals to us heavenly things. Through him who is the food of joy, the well of salvation, the spring of living waters, the sweetness of all sweetnesses, and all evil thoughts are expelled from the mind by this name. The name of him who is in the heavens, our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of all lords, heavenly reward for those who seek him with all their heart. The advantage of this prayer is that it is poor, simple, and based on an attitude of great humility. It can lead to a deep mystical life of union with God. It can be used almost anywhere and at any time, even in the midst of other occupations, and so can lead to continual prayer. Usually it becomes simplified with time, becoming no more than the invocation of the name Jesus, or something very brief such as, Jesus, I love you, or Jesus, mercy, as the Spirit prompts each individual. Above all, though this is a free gift from God and must never be forced, this prayer passes 
from the mind into the heart. That long journey. As it grows simpler, it is interiorized so as to become nearly automatic and constant. A kind of perpetual indwelling of the name of Jesus in one's heart. Oh, this makes me really want to do this. Bearing this name within it, bearing this name within within it in love, the heart prays ceaselessly, and one makes one's own home there, in the heart, where the name of Jesus dwells, that name from which flow love and peace. Your name is perfume poured out. That's Song of Songs, verse chapter 1, verse 3. The Jesus prayer clearly is an excellent kind of mental prayer, but it is a gift not given to everyone, at least not in the form just described. Yet that's no reason not to pray by keeping the name of Jesus in our hearts and minds as much as possible and repeating repeating often and lovingly. This is a way of being united to God since the name represents re presents, indeed makes present the person. So that's what I was just saying earlier. To say the name of Jesus is to make him present to you. The danger of the Jesus prayer would be to try to force things by attempting a mechanical, tiring repetition of it that would end in nervous tension. We don't want that. And frankly, a lot of people pray the rosary that way. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Da, 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 da. Let me get it through. Let me say my rosary. And they're not entering, entering into the rest. They're not entering into the scene, into the meditation, into the refreshment and renewal, into the grace. So we don't want to become like scrupulous, like I've got to check off all these boxes and jump through all of the hoops. No, that just makes us more anxious. It should be prayed in moderation, gently and unforced without trying to, pro- to prolong it longer than God grants us and leaving it up to him to transform it into something more interior and continual if he so desires. Recall the principle. So let's, I'm just looking at my Jesus right here. Lord Jesus, I just ask right now for this grace to enter into your presence with, by just the repetition of your name today in our hearts. If it be your will, Lord, that you would grant that to us and that we would experience your presence with us today by the sweet, gentle, loving repetition of your name. Amen. Recall the principle laid down at the start. Deep prayer is not the result of a technique. It is a grace, a gift. That's a good place for us to stop. Deep prayer is not the result of a technique. It's not the breathing exercises. It's not because you're doing it right. Our whole job is just to make ourselves, our hearts available and prepare the soil so that God can plant what he wants to plant in us and do what he wants to do in us and bring us to the level of holiness that he wants of us. You know, for those of us who have gone to, you know, we're real about, all about getting straight A's in school and getting the gold stars and the marks. It may be a temptation for us to want us to do this right, to get our gold star. And this is really more a path of humility, of letting God do what he wants to do in us and being okay with that. But we have to show up. So let's make our time today for prayer. Um, If we've already prayed the rosary, that is a beautiful start to the day and powerful prayer, but I would encourage you to make some time just for you and the Lord alone today. 30 minutes if you can, um, to do Alexio Divina, to read today's gospel, to chew on it, to ask the Lord what he's saying to you personally. And you can also just Google Lexio, L-E-C-T-I-O, Lexio Divina, D-I-V-I-N-A, and it'll you can find all kinds of things online about how Um, the method of praying that Ignatius taught that is fruitful for people. Okay. All right. Time for us to close. Tomorrow is Saturday, which means notebook study. We'll be back on Monday. Enjoy your weekend. We start the rosary at 7 a.m. Central Time on the weekends, not at 6 a.m. Because um, sleep is a precious and beautiful commodity. 
Okay, my darlings. Let's end with something cheerful. I think I'll do God will provide. Lord, we know that you're going to provide for everything that we need. In the fullness of the moment. Today during the rosary, I read a, an excerpt from St. Faustina's diary. And if you go to um, the Kitty Cleveland Music Facebook page, I have it posted there. I think I might also put it on my blog. If you're not subscribed to my blog, I would invite you to do that. That's where I post things most frequently. Well, that's not true. Instagram and YouTube and Facebook, I'm posting all of these videos daily. But if you want to hear other news, um, other little insights or events coming up, go to kittycleveland.com. And there's um, the newsletter is different from the blog. Those are two separate things to sign up for. But I think I'll post it there on my blog when I finish this video. And also speaking of, please do like and share this video. If you look right down below, there's a little, um, looks like a paper airplane. If you click on that, you can share it to your story and then type in like, come join us for book studies or whatever. Okay, so God will provide. Yes, he will. I wrote this song um, when I was first starting music ministry 20 years ago. And um, there's a whole, I think I've shared that story before about Jesus and the Lamb and seeing that image of Jesus and the Lamb and three times in 24 hours. And God, this is as everything was going to hell on. He was just letting me know, I'm the good shepherd. You're the little lamb. You're the dumb sheep. I got you. So he's got you. He'll provide all you need moment by moment, the grace for the day. So be at peace. I'm going to read your comments now. God will provide all we and drink coffee. Need. He'll never leave or forsake us. He lovingly tends all his sheep. Love seeing your names and faces. plays all the woodwinds. South Africa. It's so cool. on the Be Not Afraid CD. Amen. Do your sisters sing? Do you ever all sing together? Um, some of my sisters sing, have beautiful voices. 
But you know how it is when one sister does one thing, you don't want to do it. And so, you know, none of them sing professionally. But they have beautiful voices. And the last time we all sang together, I think, was my dad's funeral. We sang Press On. So it was special. All right, friends, y'all have a great day. And I will post um, to my blog, kittycleveland.com forward slash blog, that letter from, or that um, portion from St. Faustina's diary. It's just beautiful. All right, friends, much love. Have a great day. And I will be back with the book study on Monday, 7 a.m. Central Time. Please like and share this video. Let's invite people to join us. See you later.